So even though I was listening to the lyrics of that song as the kids are walking out, my Lord, my heart, my heart wide open. Uh, I hope that uh, describes us in this uh, in this place this morning. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, before get into the word today, I just wanted to, uh, uh, yeah, just say thank you to you for being here. I think one of the things that I've realized over this last uh, eight weeks has been that it's a real privilege to be able to preach and share the word with people. Uh, maybe I took that for granted uh, at times, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to do that uh, this morning with you. And so thank you to you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I, uh, I, I value it greatly. Um, you know, I wanted to maybe just encourage you. Anybody bring your Bibles with you this morning? Some of you just hold them up real quick if you got them. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch. Others, I mean, if you have it on your phone, I would just encourage you, you know, to maybe just go back. Uh, you know, we always want to move forwards technologically and everything. But I don't know. I think sometimes it's better that we go back a little bit. And I'd encourage you to get a paper Bible and start bringing it with you. Uh, this, is, this is paper right here. Uh, you know, bringing that, bringing that with you. Why? Because I think it's really good for us to get used to the idea of opening this book opening his word and, and then opening our hearts to what's in, uh, what's in there and allowing it to affect our lives, getting really used to doing that. Because I don't know about you, but every time I did, you know, studying the word on, on, on my phone, uh, somebody would text, you know, it's the, uh, it just, just would happen. And it was really nice people. And it was, but, but there would be some distraction. And, uh, you know, I found over the last couple of months that just getting back to the spot where it's like, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to open your word and I'm going to open my heart to your word is something that we really need to get used to. And so uh, we're going to study his word today. So if you have it, let's uh, let's open that together. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 13. But before I get there, I I, I would just like to uh, take a moment to thank some people in my life that uh, are truly, truly important. You know, over the last eight weeks, um, just having the chance to take a breather, to take a break, uh, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to my beautiful wife, Beth. We've been married 19 years this week, and uh, yeah, it's a... <laughs> She's been amazing uh, throughout, but even just in the last couple of uh, months, so seeing the time uh, that she sacrificed so that I could take time... Uh, being a sounding board, being a support through all of it, hon, I'm really grateful to you for that, so thank you. Nope. <laughs> um, I'm thankful to my... I'm thankful... <laughs> we're going to make it today. Thankful to my uh, children, uh, to Reese uh, and to Lincoln and Max and Finn. I think they're downstairs, but for the summer of great memories, thank you, and thank you for your patience when Dad was you know, a mess. Um, thank you to the SLT team, our leaders, uh, the ones who, who uh, spoke while I was away, uh, to, to um, your favorite guest speaker, Gary, uh, <laughs> self-proclaimed, and it's all right. It's, uh, uh, and to uh, Charlie and Zach and Brian, uh, thank you for, for leading and speaking. Thank you to our board. Many, many of you are here, Rick and Nate and Dennis. I don't know if he's here, but Kevin and Bruce and, and others uh, and Amy uh, saw uh, something saw something wrong in my life and you know and realized that I that I needed some time. They saw it and they did their best to make sure that I would actually have that time, made that possible. And I, I'm extremely grateful to them for that. Um, to our team leaders, so many Sharon, Chris, uh, Esther. There's so many others as well, and probably missing your names. But thank you for continuing to lead your teams faithfully over this summer. And to those who are in part of small groups and. And, uh, you know, serving in Bible studies and just thank you for, for doing that, for being the church, for pastoring and discipling uh, one another. And to the volunteers, oh man, thank you for serving Christ by serving his church. Uh, it has been, I, I was able to go and just know without any kind of thought or anxiety in my mind about what would happen here because you truly are the church and I'm grateful to journey together with you. And, and most of all, I'm... Uh, I can't skip this part. I'm really thankful to the Lord Jesus. This morning, thankful that he is the light in the times of darkness, for real. He is the daily bread that sustains us in our daily lives. He is the peace when the storms of anxiety come. He's the only one who can save a dying man, fill an empty man, and satisfy a weary man. He is the only one. He's the one who gave his life for me. 
and the only one worth living my life for. And I aim to pursue him, to please him, and to praise him. And in the words of Paul, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine, to him be glory and praise in his church and in every generation forever and ever. Amen. 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 He is the reason why we are here. He's the reason why I'm here. Let us never forget that truth. Uh, As I thought about what to share today, it was actually really hard to narrow it down. I didn't spend eight weeks preparing for a sermon. Some of you are like, wow, if he could do that in one week, what are we going to get in eight weeks? (laughs) Probably about eight hours, but uh, (laughs) just kidding. Uh, There was just so much, but I didn't prepare to preach. I just actually spent eight weeks not preparing for messages, just spending time in his word just to be with him, to pursue him. And so today I, I realize those are the things, so some of the lessons I learned this summer that I think of, are, are of value to each of us, and that is to pursue him, to please him, and to praise him. And so um, we're going to look at Matthew 13, verse 44. But before we get there, I, just, I was thinking about how much I, I like, I, I'm inspired by and I like treasure hunters. Anybody else, you know, treasure hunters? Lots of people like treasure hunters. There's, you know, there's shows about it. There's the movies of the pirates who, you know, going, you know, all over looking for buried treasure. Uh, I know that it's popular because, you know, the, the pirates of the Caribbean, man, those movies made big, big money because there's people who are, who are interested in, you know, Jack Sparrow searching for buried treasure. I, I thought about the guy, you know, just wandering down the, port, the, the beaches of Port Dover with his little uh, metal detector. You know, he's, he's looking for somebody else's lost treasures. And then I thought about my wife and uh, her sister, and they're like these fanatics for um, going thrifting uh, to the thrift stores and looking for somebody else's abandoned treasures. And uh, sometimes, well, ev- okay, one time she took me along uh, to, you know, to go thrifting, and I'm just like, I just don't get it, right? I'm like, I, 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 there's, I hate shopping, and I'm like, I, just, I don't like this. She's like, well, just go to the book section then, you know? There's li- and I'm like... Uh, there's only one thing I hate more than shopping. And that's reading, right? So I'm like, I'm not going to like love this. But I went, I went to the book section and, you know, I, I shared the story before where as I sat there, I'm like, I was like, what am I, what, I I'm not going to be able to read any of these whole books, but where's one with pictures? And I saw this one with golf and I was like, oh, I'll grab that. And as I opened it up, there inside was somebody had been so- saving a $20 bill. Didn't realize that they had sent it. And I was like, sweet. And as I was going to take it, the conscience kicked in. So that's not yours. And I was like, dang. And then all of a sudden I realized, I looked at the back of the book, $2. So I'm like, put it back in, go pay $2, take the 20 toss the, t- toss the book. And I was like, found treasure. Don't look at me like that. I bought that book. It was my treasure. <laughs> but, but I remember that, that joy of, man, I found I found that treasure. And then, and then I also think of times where, you know, where I didn't. I was like, I remember as a kid, anybody else uh, eat Lucky Charms when you were a kid? Your parents did that to you? Yeah. Um, Lucky Charms has like the leprechaun at the, you know, on there. And the, and the commercials would always tell you, like, uh, the, the, the commercials would always tell you that at the end of the rainbow, there was a pot of gold. And uh, I was like, man, like that would be like the best thing ever to happen in my life. And then one day, the unthinkable happened. I'd waited my whole life, a whole six years to see this. And there I saw where the rainbow ended. It was in my uncle's field. Halfway across, right in the middle, is a massive tree, and I saw the rainbow ended there. And so I'm like, man, we're going. And so I got my little wagon, and I got my little brother. He's five. I was six. We got dad's big shovel, and we started, like, slogging through the wet, muddy clay, freshly, like, worked field to this tree. It was foggy, and we got there, and we started digging, and we dug, and we dug until we found dismay. (laughs) Nothing. Found nothing. You know, brokenhearted, and then I looked, and I was like, the rainbow's gone. Maybe the treasure disappears when the rainbow leaves. So next time I find a rainbow, i got to get there quicker. And maybe invite Mark DeYoung to get his excavator to get it there quicker. But I have yet, I have yet to find the end of the rainbow. And some of you look at me and laugh at me, but I think you probably relate to the fact of being a six-year-old thinking I'm going to find treasure and finding nothing. I've been in both places where I have the joy of finding treasure and that, that, empty feeling of not finding it. And as I thought about that, I I realized that Jesus often talked about the topic of treasure. And over the summer, I learned a lot about that. And I want to share that with you. Go to Matthew 13. Let's open our Bibles. We'll go there together. All my um, little markers fell out this morning on my way here. But got your Bibles? Matthew 13. Here it says in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure 
It's like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again, sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. You, go, you guys okay with that guy? Yeah, you should be, you know, so you can be okay with me buying the book, right? It's in the Bible. Uh, but he says the kingdom of God is like a treasure. And he says, you know what? He's talking to regular people, and he says, hey, listen. He says, again, let me, let me explain this to you. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovers a pearl of great value, he sells everything else that he owns, and he buys it. And so Jesus is explaining to like normal, regular people, he's like, hey, the kingdom of heaven, this thing that you can't really see, it is worth finding. If you find it, man, it is worth everything if you can find it. And if it's worth finding, it's worth seeking, it's worth looking for. But as Jesus talked about this idea of treasure and the kingdom of heaven, God's way of living, God's way of doing things, he, um, he, he comes across these circumstances or situations where people have something that blocks them from it. Something stops them from finding it. They, they, they want it, but they can't get there. So just flip over a couple pages to Matthew 19. Oh, good, I hear pages. Sweet. Matthew 19. This guy comes up to Jesus. He's a rich young man, it says. You know, and I think about that, and I thought, man, I'd owe to be young again. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, and then to be young and have money? Like, that never happens to most people. But, like, young man, rich man, has everything. He's missing one thing. He's missing one thing. And he hears about Jesus, this man, Jesus, who's offering eternal life. And he's like, okay, that's the thing I don't have. Let me go ask him. And he comes up to Jesus. And, you know, like when a rich person comes up, like if somebody drove a Ferrari into the parking lot today, everybody's kind of like they notice. And it's like Matthew writes this, this thing. It's like this was, a, this was one of the moments in all of the stories that Jesus happened that people noticed. And this rich young man comes up to Jesus, and maybe he pulls in in his Mustang, you know, like the real ones. And he, he rides in, and he's like, hey. He's like, Jesus, like, what do I got to do to, to inherit eternal life, to, to earn eternal life? And, and Jesus like, looks at him and says, hey, you got you to gotta keep all of these, you know, commandments. And he's like... Not only am I rich, not only do I have it all, I've done it all. I've kept all of those. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay, you know what? Let's press a little deeper. Because actually that wasn't the point. I didn't really care if you kept them all. I want to know where your heart's at. So let, let me press a little deeper. And here's what he says. He says to him, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, you know, if you want to have done it all, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And then you will have what? treasure in heaven. That's what he describes as treasures in heaven. And he says, and then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for why he had many possessions. See, he thought possessions were treasures. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. The possessions are actually keeping you from treasures. Give those away and you'll find real treasure. And then Jesus said to his disciples after the man had walked away, he's like, man, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's like, I'll tell you again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And some are thinking like it's the eye of the needle. Others are like, well, there was a gate called the eye of the needle. Either way, it is really difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And Jesus is like, this is my point. It's difficult for people who think that wealth and possessions are the treasure. It's difficult for them to get to the real treasure. And the disciples were astounded. Like, just remember that. Their response was like, Jesus, like, <laughs> how could you say something like that? Then they asked, well, then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, that's impossible. But with God, everything is possible. You know, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that famous, that famous sermon that he uh, shared probably many times, he told people, don't store up for yourself treasures on, uh, treasures on earth. He's, he's, you know, let's read it together, Matthew 6, verse 19. He says in Matthew 6, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Moths are going to eat them. Rust will destroy them. Thieves will break in and steal them. Verse 20, instead, store up treasure where? In, in heaven. Store up treasure in heaven where moths can't get it. Rust can't destroy it. Thieves don't break in and steal. And verse 21, where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. You know, he's, he's saying your treasure and your heart, they're, they're, they're really closely connected. And if you're here thinking this morning, you know, that, that I'm going to be like, okay, everybody, you know, you got to give away all your treasures, you know, give it to the pastor. That's not going to, that's not how this is going. Because that was the thing for this man, but it's not always the thing. What Jesus was saying, it's about the heart. 
There's something about the heart and the treasure that go together. And you know, I was thinking, Jesus is like, hey, store for yourself treasures in heaven. I thought about like the young, there's a whole bunch of young people here last night and some here this morning. Like, you know, when I was your age, they're thinking like, treasure in heaven, what is that even? Like, what is treasure in heaven? And I thought about, you know, the treasures we have here, you know, the things of value, gold, silver, jewels, whatever. But have you thought that no matter how much gold you get here, you get there, it's only pavement. You know, it's all, you think about heaven, it's, the streets are paved with gold. There's no real value to that. You know, you get the big house someday, you're like, I'm going to work for that treasure, that, that big house. It's like a garden shed compared to the mansion you get there. There's no value to it. And he says, you know, as you cross from this life into that one, you have to leave all those behind you. Realize there was no value to them. So what is the treasure that we would actually see and receive in heaven? And the truth is the treasure is him. That will be the treasure. Knowing him, you'll be like, what gold? Who cares? Look at him. Look at the angels just worshiping him. I get to know him. I get to know face to face the God of the universe. That in itself will be the treasure that you will never take your eyes off of for the rest of eternity. It will be, he will truly be more than enough. You know, I think about that thought. And that's what Jesus was like pressing to the heart of people saying, hey, is that your treasure? Is that your treasure? It's why he told the rich man, hey, your possessions will actually keep you from the real treasure, the real treasure. You know, over the summer, I think the greatest realization I had is that as a person, I had stopped treasure hunting. I stopped treasure hunting. I, I, I really, uh, the reason I got to like borderline burnout was that I had stopped treasuring him. I don't know where it started, but I know that I couldn't sustain carrying on once I'd realized that that was the, the, where, where I was. You know, I had all the other stuff together. If you remember my like, little escapade with my brother, I felt like that too. Like I had all the right stuff. I had my wagon and I had my shovel and I had my disciples. You know, I had people who were going to follow along, walk with me and do this thing. Uh, you know, I, I had it all. I, was on the, I had the journey, but I didn't have the treasure. I didn't, didn't have the treasure. You know, I, I think that um, sometimes that's where we find ourselves. We can be tempted to think that we got all the right things. You know, we attend church, we pray, we fast, we do all these things. But then we start thinking those are the point. And then we settle for those being the point, and we miss the treasure. We stop treasure hunting. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I just, I guess, doing those things without actually doing them to find him. You know, the truth is, it's not always money. It's not always possessions that get in the way. There's other things. You know, some of them, uh, you know, like business, for instance. Business is one of those things that gets in the way of searching for treasure. Uh, you know, I feel like sometimes you get so busy doing good things, even as a pastor. Man, I'm doing, doing good things for the Lord. And, and, I, and, I, and I had shared about this, that I had this struggle in my life for a couple of years, but never finding the way to actually slow down and say, I'm going to adjust something in my life. You know, the treasure hunting had become less of a priority because other things sort of take the priority. And, and I don't know about you, but I would, I'd say things like, oh yeah, I know that I want to, I know that I want to spend time with him, but okay, I'm going to do it later today because I just got a really important text this morning and I'd go do that. And then, and then later today would come and I would get there and I'd be like, oh man, I got this, this, and this. I'll, I'll do later tonight. And then tonight would happen. And guess what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow morning, Lord. <laughs> and then tomorrow morning would happen. And be like, oh, quickly, we had a devotional. Be like, okay, you know, I, I'll do more later. Man, like, it's crazy. And I, and I was busy. And then I read this thing. I just want to share it with you. It's by Eugene Peterson, the guy who actually uh, wrote the Message Bible. But he wrote, he wrote these words. He says, I'm busy because I'm vain. And I was like, what? I read it again. I'm like, I'm busy because I'm vain? He writes this. I want to appear important. I want to appear significant. I live in a society with crowded schedules and harassed conditions and that those are evidence of importance. So I develop a crowded schedule and a harassed conditions. And when others notice, they acknowledge my significance and my ego is fed. It's like people come like, oh, I know you're so busy. I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm a pretty important person. I'm busy. And then he goes on to say this, I'm busy because I'm lazy. And I was like, man, that's the worst thing you could say to me. That was the hardest thing for me this time off was to take time off because I thought you guys are going to think I'm lazy. Some of you felt led to tell me. <laughs> but you kept it to yourselves. I'm so... 
But he says, you know, as I read this, I was like, man, it jumped out at me. I'm busy because I'm lazy. Why? He says, I indolently let others decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding it for myself. It was actually a favorite theme of C.S. Lewis that only lazy people work hard. I thought, what? That, that, that doesn't seem right. But he says, by lazily abdicating the essential work of deciding, directing, and establishing values and goals, we let other people do it for us. And all he's saying is this. If treasure hunting, if I'm too busy for treasure hunting, I'm too busy. I'm lazy enough to say, that is not gonna, that's not my priority, or I won't do whatever it takes to make that my priority, and everything else just allows it to fill in until it no longer is priority, and I stop treasure hunting. And I was so challenged by those words. You know the thing about the sting of being lazy? The thing of it wasn't so much that I'm so busy, it's the reason I was so busy. It's because I wanted to please people. I just want everybody to be happy. I want people to, to be pleased. I don't want to disappoint anyone. And I felt that, you know, my, every decision I make had to please everyone. Try doing that for two years. The last two years. Oh, man, exhausting. But not realizing that that was happening. You know, I felt that every, every decision was that important. I felt like every sermon had to be better than the last one. That, you know, it's like, and you're some of you like, well, next week should be, you know, easy, right? <laughs> but, but it's like the, 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 the last one, I, I always wanted it to be better. I never wanted people to go home and say, oh, you know, like, I brought my friends and family and he talked about money, you know, or I brought my kids and he talked about sex and it's like, oh, disappoint or whatever, whatever it was. I'm like, I always want to make sure. Or somebody would say, oh, they didn't do, you know, my favorite worship songs. I'm like, okay, I'll try and correct that. And it's like all of this feelings of trying to control everything so that everybody's going to be happy. And guess what? It didn't work. It doesn't work. To be honest, it was like this even as I was preparing for this Sunday. I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to reset the bar super, super low. <laughs> I was like, I was hoping the guest speakers would do that, but, uh, you know, Gary's hitting home runs, Zach Brown, I'm like, oh, man, like, even these rookies are just like, just top-notch stuff, and I'm like, you know, but it's, that's, that's how weird it is. I'm like, okay, let's do that so I can get back into my routine of trying to please you next week. You know what? The truth I've learned is this. We don't actually need another great sermon. We need a genuine connection with him. You don't need another great sermon that you'll forget three minutes after you leave. You need to know that you met with Jesus each and every time that we get together. And you know, this thing, that will be my goal from here on in, is that you connect with Christ. That is it. Whether the songs are the right ones, man, I hope you connect with Christ. Whether the message is like, yay, nay, whatever, I hope that you connect with Christ, because that is who we need. He's the treasure. Nothing else really, really matters. You know, I learned that Jesus disappointed people, and that set me free. I thought to disappoint people, I must be doing something wrong, and then I watched, and I saw, wow, Jesus disappointed lots of people because he was on a mission to please one person. Man, may that be the story of my life. I'm not pleasing men, but living to please my Heavenly Father. You know where I saw it? It was in the story with this young man. It was one of them. When the rich young ruler came, when that rich young guy came, and he's like, hey, Jesus, what can I do to be a part of your team? I can just imagine the disciples all looking like, Jesus, we want this guy. Like, he's rich. Bring him on. You know, no more craft dinner for us. We're going to be eating the, the keg, like, every week if you could just get him on our team. You know how I know that? Because when Jesus said to the man, he's like, man, he's like, here's a guy who comes to Jesus, I want to follow you, you know, tell me what I got to do. And Jesus is like, this is what you got to do, I want your heart. And what does he do? He walks away sad, and Jesus doesn't go after him. He doesn't. And the disciples are astounded. They're like, Jesus, how could you say that to him? What I learned is Jesus didn't watch the man go. Mark says that in his account, he's like, Jesus genuinely loved that man as he walked away. But he let him walk away. He didn't run after him and say, hey, okay, sorry I offended you with what I said today. What can I do? What can I say to fix it? What can I do that you're going to come back and be a part of this? What are you going to do to, you know, that you'll come back and join us? You know, whoa, 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 whoa. What do I got to do to make you happy? What do I have to do to make you happy? He didn't, he didn't do it. Do you know when I thought about it? That's what I would do. That's what I've done lots of times. Okay, okay, sorry. I didn't mean to say that. What, what do I need to say to make you happy? But you know what I learned <laughs> over this last couple of uh, months is that Jesus didn't change his message to him because if he changed the gospel message, it likely wouldn't save him. If he changed 
the truth of the gospel message, it wouldn't be enough to save that man. And so today, you know, there's going to be things you hear that you're like, man, I don't like to hear that. It didn't make me happy, but that's okay. That's okay. You know, I think happiness has become like the idol of our time. And for Christians as well. It's like we'll pursue happiness as if it's the goal. And it's not. It is not a treasure worth pursuing. You'll pursue happiness and you won't get it. Fair for a while, but you'll lose it. But you pursue him, (laughs) you'll gain a treasure that comes with great joy and periods of happiness along with it that you can have without regret. He didn't say to this man, what do I got to do to make you happy? Because he knew that man would have to come to a place to realize, man, I'm a sinner. I'm not enough. I got idols in my life that I need to surrender, and I don't want to, but I need a Savior. I've got to admit that I need a Savior. He's like, all those things, you know, that, that, those are the things that he needed to hear. That he might realize that Christ would be a more valuable treasure than whatever treasures he had been seeking in his life. You know, Paul, last scripture today, Galatians 1. Just flip over there if you, if you know where it is. Galatians 1, he just writes this letter to the Galatian church, and in verse 10, like he's not even barely through his greeting, he says this to them. He says, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God, because if pleasing people was my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. He's like, man, if that's the goal, I'm not, I'm not Christ's servant. If I'm going to try and please people, I, I can't please him. Paul wrote to the Romans and explained it in verse 2, uh, 29, verse, he says this, it's a, it's a change of heart that's produced by God's spirit. He says, that's what happens here. And he says, and when a person has a changed heart, they seek the praise of God and not of men. And so I've learned that, you know, you're going to disappoint people sometimes in your pursuit of him, but he's worth it. And sometimes that disappointment's going to try and keep you from treasure hunting, but don't let it. Don't let it. Sometimes you're going to have to say no to things and no to people so that you can say yes to him. Sometimes you're going to have to hold to truth, even if it makes people unhappy, but do it to please him. Sometimes you're going to have to just simply choose to make pleasing him your goal. And why? Why? For me, the test came right away. You know, am I going to please him or am I going to please men? It immediately happened on the first day back to work. I had anxiety about coming to these, to these services because of that same test. But you know, all I care about now is that one day I will leave this planet. I will close my eyes here and I will take my last breath. I will open them to see him face to face like Isaiah describes and that he would say, Mark, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You lived to please me and the praise of men will mean nothing in that moment. And some of you have heard me talk about this multiple times because this has been my life struggle I just never found a way to to cut that until this last eight weeks. And that is why I'm so grateful that you gave me that time. That time to allow that change to happen. And so let's close with these thoughts. How about you? How are you doing really? How is your pursuit of him really? How's your treasure hunting really? Two months ago you asked me. I wouldn't want to answer it. I've asked people, and we're like, man, it's, it's an awkward conversation. Becky and I were talking about the other day. She's like, yeah, how come we don't ask that question as much, you know, often? I think because in North America, we know the answer. Probably not as good as it could be. But he's a treasure worth finding. He's a treasure worth seeking. And so I think about this. How, are you, how is your treasure hunting going? You know, my kids watch this guy named Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast does these crazy videos where he spends millions of dollars to make a video, and then he makes probably billions on it. Uh, but the one that, that they showed me, he's like, Dad, this guy, he, Mr. Beast, he bought a private island. And then he brought six people to that private island. He says, OK, listen, somewhere on this island, there's a treasure chest. And in it is the deed to the island. Whoever finds it gets it. Man, those six people, what do you th- how do you think they went treasure hunting? Oh, OK, maybe I'll find it. Mm, let's see, maybe, maybe it's somewhere. Hmm. Hmm. No, you watch them. I mean, they booked it, and they were looking for hours, digging in, like, whatever it took to find. Whatever it took to find. And that's what I ask. What does your treasure hunting look like? I know what mine looked like. That was probably mine. It was like fishing, like, with a lure with no hook on it. You know, it looked like I'm doing it. I'm, like, reading my Bible. I'm going to church. Nothing on it. You know, or, like, uh, metal detecting, but d- didn't turn the power on. There's no beeping, but, like, hey, everybody, look at me. Look at me. I'm metal detecting. You know, or mowing the lawn with the deck up. And, you know, you finish mowing the lawn. You look, you're like, whoa. 
Nothing happened, but everybody thought, man, he's, he mowed the lawn. Nothing happened. You know, the, the whole thing is, did you find the treasure? Have you found the treasure? And I say it this way, have you found him today? Because I think the greatest thing that we sometimes believe is that, oh, I found Jesus. I gave my life to Christ. I found Christ. And it was oh, this one day moment somewhere in your past history. But that's not what treasure hunting is all about. It's like, how do I find him today? Because I need him today. He's the only one that matters today. What does that look like? And for myself, it looks like stopping every, every day, just sitting in silence. As awkward as that is, saying, Jesus, I just want to be with you. Sick. I'll listen as long as it takes. I just want to hear your voice. And if you don't want to talk today, that's okay. I just want to be with you. And I'll be here again tomorrow. And I'd open his word because I'm not just listening for like some voices out there. Or that you close your eyes and like, oh, I got to see Jesus. And you're like, oh, I see him. I don't see him. I see him. I don't, I don't see him. It's not like that. He's given us his word. And so as you're reading, it's like, Lord, let me slowly just read. Not to prepare a sermon. Just talk to this heart. Just talk to my heart. And God, I'll worship you. I never picked up my guitar once because I'm like, I don't want to use, you know, something that's just a routine to me. I just want, I just want to sing to you your truth, who you are. What a beautiful name. What a powerful name. Let me not lose sight of those truths today. Jesus, fill me with you. Fill me with you. You know, maybe it looks different for you, and I know it will because... Not everybody can take the morning off and say, this is what I'm going to do. What does your treasure hunting look like? It may be different for you. Maybe it's at work, you know, halfway through at lunchtime. You just take a few minutes like, man, all the guys are going to go eat together. But Jesus, this is my time. I want you. Maybe it's at spare during school. The rest are like, oh, let's go to the smoke pit. And you're like, mm, I got something else that's more important to me. Maybe as a mom, you're like, yeah, okay. There is not spare 15 minutes in any day. It might be, you know, that 15 minutes before the kids wake up. You're just like, you know what? I'll quietly walk through the house so they don't wake up. But Jesus, I just want you. I just want you. I don't know what it looks like for you, but that treasure is worth finding, and that means he's worth pursuing. And I just pray, you know, that my pursuit of him would reflect in a small way his pursuit of me. That he left heaven and hung on a cross to come find me. And I have done nothing to that level in return to find him. But man, that we would pursue him. So what are the things that maybe get in your way? Maybe it was some of the things we mentioned today. Maybe something totally different. But praying that we'd pursue him and please him. And to make it a three-point sermon, praise him. I'm not even talking about that point, but just couldn't help myself. Three-point, you know, that, that, that our lives would praise him. And finally, maybe, you know, today you feel like heavy, weary, empty, broken. Jesus stood up and he called out to people who were like that. Maybe, maybe it's just the weight of the world on your shoulders. Maybe it's like you're not even a Jesus follower, but he's calling out to people today. And he said to them, hey, if you're feeling heavy and weary and empty and broken, come to me and I'll give you rest. You know, as I read it today in the Message Bible this morning, he just simply said this, are you burned out on religion? Are you tired of doing all that stuff? He's like, <laughs> he's like come to me and, and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn how to live your life by a different heartbeat, by a different drum. You're still going to be you. You're just going to be moving to a different, a different rhythm, a different rhythm of life. That's what I had to do over this time was take a, diff- a chance to change the rhythm. And, you know, I leave you with this thought. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Lily, uh, she's out west, but she's part of our Bible study that we do every morning. And she, a couple days ago when we were reading this, she said it reminded her of this story where there's this guy who was um, giving an illustration. He was holding a yoke, and he had the yoke with had these bricks on it and was heavy. And he, and he got another guy to come up who was a little shorter and stand, you know, stand with him. He says, okay, let's stand at arm's length. And this yoke was long, and at the other end of the arm's length, as he stood there, he said, okay, how, how, how heavy is the load over there? And the man was carrying the full weight of the bricks on this end, and he's like, it's heavy. And then he said, okay, now make your way over towards me. And he asked him to stand right beside him. And being a little short, he says, okay, how much how much are you carrying now? He's like, nothing. And it's just that thought, that that thought that Jesus is saying the same thing to us. Don't, don't, don't try and do all the things. I'm gonna go to church, I'm gonna do all the things, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna read my Bible to try and lift this load. 
He's like, just come closer to me. If you'll just come to me, truly come to me. It doesn't matter what, how, what that looks like. That, that might not involve any of the things I just described. Just come to me. And I will give you true rest. Some of you have been running and running and running, trying to figure it all out. Some of you have been running from God, thinking, I'll find it. I'll find a way to make my life make sense and matter. You won't. He's calling you to become a treasure hunter. He's calling you to come to him. Maybe you don't know the Lord today. And as you hear all this stuff, something triggers in your heart. That's his voice. That's his voice calling you. And I would tell you simply this, that it requires you to turn from the life you're living. You can't do both. You will burn out trying to do both. To leave it and say, I don't want, God, I'll leave that all behind. Those friends, those behaviors, those actions, those thought processes, everything, God, I'm going to leave the old me behind, and I just want you. You will get him, and you won't regret it for a minute. It's my encouragement to us as a church. May we be the place of treasure hunters. And when you come together, may it be a place of like, man, Jesus, I just want your presence today. I, he's always around, but God, I just want you. I just want you. As we close today, normally, I don't know if we still do that, close with questions. You know, put questions up on the screen. And I thought, you know what? We put questions up on the screen because people were at home during COVID or doing small groups and they needed something to talk about. And then I realized we do the questions. Everybody's like, yep, that's the cue to go. We're done. That's what we've learned. That's the routine. That's the rhythm we've learned. And it's a bad one. It's a bad rhythm if you saw the questions and never asked them. So I just want to pray together with one question. And it's this that we would just take a couple minutes, just right now, just to be quiet, and say, Lord, Lord Jesus, what are you saying to me through this message today? Why am I here? What did I need to hear? And it will be awkward, I promise you. And you're going to want to sneak out because everyone's eyes are closed. But I just challenge you, just for a minute, Would you just close your eyes? Tune everything else out around you. Lord Jesus, we are so go, go, go. Don't even know how to sit still sometimes. But we came here this morning because we need you. We may not even have realized that on our way here. But you know. So we sit here for a moment quietly. God, would you speak? Would you just remind people in their hearts today of what you wanted them to hear and why they were here today? Life's going to pull us in lots of directions as soon as we leave this place. Help us to be aware of you. May these times of silence and just pondering and listening for you and your voice, may they become less and less awkward all the time as we hear your voice. Thank you that we can breathe and just be with you. Just be with you. Lord, our, our, our hearts are sorry for 
allowing it to become something other than what you always desired it to be. Sorry for stopping the search for hunting for different treasures. Thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for bringing us back. Jesus, I pray that in this place, as we gather with that purpose, that many, many will find you here. And that everyone here today will find you again later today and tomorrow and the next day and finding your presence. Lord, and do in our hearts what you desire to do, how fast or how slow, doesn't matter. We just are confident that you, what you begin in us, you will complete. Help us keep our eyes on you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. I praise you for it, Jesus. You truly deserve the highest praise. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I know it's different, but don't let your Christianity be anything less than Christ. Have a fantastic week with him. And thanks for having me back. Hopefully, I'm welcome back next week. <laughs> we will see you soon. Love you guys. Oh, and go get your kids, I think. <laughs> we'll see you later. another great sermon that you'll forget three minutes after you leave. You need to know that you met with Jesus each and every time.